In fact, in Shakespeare, in his play Henry IV, some of the characters are talking about bees, and they mention that the bees are soldiers and they have a king. That's what people thought in Shakespeare's day. They thought the bees you see flying, these are men, bees. And they go home and they answer to the king. Well, it's not true. Those are female. They go home, they have a queen. <laughs> but it, it took modern uh, investigation in the last 300 years to realize that that's the case. The Quran is right. But it had a 50-50 chance of being right. But here's another situation where it could have guessed incorrectly. The Quran talks about the sun and how it travels through space. Now, if the sun is moving through space, there's at least two options. It could be traveling just as a stone would travel if you threw it, or it could be traveling with its own motion. The Quran says it has its own motion, it uses a form of the word sabaha, which if you use that word and you talk about a man, if you say he uh, did this, uh, yasbah, along the ground, you don't mean that somebody rolled him, you mean he's walking. If you say that of a man in water, you don't mean that he's floating, you mean he's swimming. If you say that of the sun, you don't mean that it's just flying through space, you mean it's turning as it goes through space. Well, the Quran says the sun turns. Is that an easy thing to discover? Can you tell the sun is turning? If you look at it, you can look for a, a second or two and you have to look away. You don't see any marks on it. You don't see anything after a few seconds. But in modern times, the equipment was made available to project the image of the sun down onto a tabletop so that you could look at it without being blinded. And then you see that after all, there are spots on the sun. And they move. And the sun turns once every 25 days. So it is turning. But that's a modern discovery. A lucky guess. But the odds are one in four about getting both of these guesses about the bees and the sun correct. And another indication would be to think back 14 centuries ago, people probably didn't understand about time zones, but back at home right now, my family's having breakfast. Oh, but it's dark here, and the sun just came up there. See, 14 centuries ago, a man could only travel about 35 miles a day. And if he traveled from India to Morocco, it took him months. And probably when he had supper in Morocco, he thought, back at home, they're having supper now in India. Because he didn't realize he has moved across the time zones. But the Quran is aware of that. It tells you in an interesting ayah, it says that when history finishes, when the judgment day arrives, it will happen in an instant. History ends in an instant. But it mentions that in that instant, it will catch some people in the daytime and some people in the nighttime. So which Muslim scientists have been aware for 14 centuries. If they believed that, they said, well, at some time on the earth, it's day and night at the same time. That's not a thing that's obvious to your eyes or to your experience, but the Quran mentions that. So again, it's a good guess. And you can draw up a long list of good guesses, and the odds become very high that these are all guesses. To do this kind of thing is following in the best tradition of the Muslims, to investigate that way. The Quran expects this kind of challenge. You see, if I said to somebody, I pick out somebody here, I said, you, I know your father, I met your father. Probably he's in doubt. So you just came here. <laughs> how do you know my father? For all I know, he has no, his father is dead. For all I know. Is he, he's saying, how could you have met my father? Tell me, is he a tall man, short, bald, does he have a beard, does he wear glasses? Where did you meet him? But if I keep giving him all the right answers, finally he may say, I guess you know my father. I don't know how, but I guess you know him. The Quran is in the same situation. It says that it originates with the one who originated everything. So you have a right to say, convince me. If the author of this book really originated life, originated the heavens and the earth, he should know about this, he should know about that. Tell me something that proves you were there when life came to be. Do you know this? Do you know that? And that's what people have examined in every generation for 14 centuries. We all know something for sure. We don't have to be an expert on uh, something in an academic field. 
I mentioned to you when I started, the sailor. What he knows is his experience. He knows what a storm is like on the ocean. Everybody knows something. They have a right to say, I wonder, does the author of the Quran know that thing? For myself, uh, because of my field uh, in mathematics and logic, there's a very delicate point which caused quite a bit of excitement only a hundred years ago among mathematicians. It occurred to me the author of the Quran should know about that. It would take too much explaining to go into it, but I checked and he did. It's there in the Quran. But it's a, a development of the last hundred years in logic. We all know something and it should be there. The answer should be there. We should be ready to give an account to justify ourselves. That's the meaning of Iman. Iman is not properly translated faith, which usually means, uh, in English, faith means a promise to believe something even though it seems it must be impossible. You believe it without evidence. That's faith. Iman is not that. The root meaning of that word means confirmation, emuna. It means when you check on something. You believe it because you looked and you saw indications that it was true. Doesn't mean necessarily you prove every item, but you look and you see this agrees with what I know so far. You've thought about it, so your Iman grows. And you're supposed to do that all your life. I'm afraid that Muslims very often don't have the confidence to deal with these things. And yet you have the ayah in the 25th surah, the 33rd ayah, where it says there is no question that they bring you, but we give you the best answer and the explanation of it. So whatever question they have, the answer is in the Quran. I have mentioned in, in seven years of giving lectures in various places that I have basically only heard 35 questions. Now, I've heard hundreds of people ask questions, but I've heard about 35 different questions. That's all. The Quran says, no matter which question they bring you, we give you an answer. People have a long ways to go. It's an interesting thing you'll find if you look in the index of the Quran. This is a, an index of every word in the Quran, al-Mawajim al-Mufahris. It's what you should expect to find, according to this ayah. It says, for every question they bring you, we give you an answer. Allah says the answer is here. If you look up the word in the index, qalu, it means they say. You'll find it's in the Quran 332 times. 332 times the Quran says, they say such and such. And if you look up the word kul, which is the command say, you'll find it's in the Quran 332 times. Now for everything they say, you tell them this. 332 is a long ways from 35. There's a lot of questions people haven't even bothered to ask. The Quran has the answers. And it's not that big of a book about 80,000 words, which is supposed to offer you the reply to what somebody says. By way of advice, I suggest if you're going to take up this kind of activity to arm yourself with the knowledge of the Quran and the answers it gives, there's a number of things to keep in mind. Be very careful that you are considering the original wording of the Quran. I don't know of any translation in any language that doesn't contain some mistakes. In the translation. Or if not mistakes, uh, it does not make the point clearly enough as in the Arabic. Now, that's not to say every Muslim has to learn Arabic, but that is to say that the real answer to a lot of problems is contained in the Arabic. You will find a lot of examples of this kind of thing, which even when Muslims translate, that's one of the things that surprised me about the Quran, was how consistent the author is in his choice of words. If he tells a story one way, he doesn't trip himself up in another place by telling it in, different, in a different way. Don't be fooled by this kind of thing. We have in Toronto uh, a group of uh, people whose mission in life is to convert Muslims away from uh, Islam. And the Muslims always go to the lectures that they put on. <laughs> they find it very entertaining. And recently, a uh, man gave a talk and he was explaining how, he said, you know, if you Muslims paid more attention to the Quran, you might be Christians. 